Good afternoon, Dr. Sater. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's my pleasure. Um, Dr. Sater is a family doctor with a degree in human genetics and who further specialize in addiction medicine and has been working in the field of dependency for the past 30 years. We're very lucky to have you today. And I think that parents are gonna benefit from this great talk that we're about to have on dependency. So thanks again for sharing your day with us today. Um, okay, well, really, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So I wanna start with the first question. Um, as I mentioned, you have several years of experience in the field of dependency, and I think that you have your own very unique perspective on dependence and addiction. And I'd like you to be able to share that with us to invite parents about dependence and addiction. Okay, well, it's, you know, we, we have a tendency uh, when we don't know a lot, we have a tendency to, you know, point the finger at different substances and say that the substances are bad or point the finger at people and say those people are bad when we don't quite understand um, that it's, it's more of a combination of certain people with certain substances at certain times are more prone to enjoy or appreciate the effects of those substances. And the effects of those substances can be multiple, okay? So what, what I find best explains the origins, um, about 80%, so this is gonna apply to about 80% of people who develop, who develop dependencies. People are born genetically different, okay? I don't wanna say sick, I wanna say different, and that's really important. That some people are born genetically different where their p dopamine pleasure system is not as sensitive as somebody else's dopamine pleasure system. So it requires, when a, a, a neurological system isn't as sensitive, the natural thing to do is to overstimulate it so that the message gets through. So the easiest way to think about that is to think about being hard of hearing. Some people are born hard of hearing. Some people develop hard of hearing. So the natural thing to do when you're hard of hearing is to raise the volume. Now, if I don't know your hard of hearing and I come into the room and the television is at 99 and the, 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 the paintings on the wall are shaking and the wallpaper is coming off, and I'm looking at this and I say, wow, this is crazy. You're being way too excessive. Put the volume down. And I have trouble having empathy for this person until I'm told, well, my brother's deaf. He has to put the volume really high so that he actually can hear the, oh, well, then I understand. Then there's no problem. Leave it at 99 if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so addiction, the origins often come from somebody being hard of hearing for pleasure. Now, whatever gives us pleasure stimulates, by definition, our dopamine system. Okay, and there are people who are born with hypoactive dopamine systems. Okay, um, so they will be naturally attracted to anything that stimulates them a whole lot. So if you've got a five-year-old or a seven-year-old and he, he, he's like this, well, if he likes hockey, he's going to play hockey extremely so he's going to play more intensely and he's going to play longer because that's what it takes for his dopamine to be uh, fulfilled okay he's not necessarily having more pleasure than everybody else it's that he needs that excess to have the same as everybody else but people look at him and say well little joey's is excessive well he's not excessive that's who he is that's what it takes. And we have found this, 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 this phenomenon in smokers and drinkers, in kids with ADHD, in people who have um, antisocial behavior, in gamblers, um, and in eating disorders, and in depend other dependency disorders. So it's very common, and because it's a kind of common denominator, a lot of people who drink, for example, also smoke, also have ADD, and also have emotional dependency uh, problems going on at the same time. 
our tendency is to say those people have four problems. They don't. They have one common denominator that they are succeeding in stimulating in four different ways. Okay, and it's very important because when they stop using whatever substance they happen to fall upon in their life that they have abused and depended on in order to help regulate their emotions, when you send somebody to therapy, that genetic component doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So you can't expect that kid or adolescent or adult to become a dull, normal, you know, uh, I have a, a little car, a little job, a little boyfriend, uh, 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 I play a little tennis, a little golf, I read a little, and you can't expect them to become that person. They are always going to be drawn to more excess, okay, naturally. It can be worked on. We can, something that we, we, we don't learn very much to do in our society, but we need to learn to do it more. We can compensate for the difficulty in having pleasure by learning how to be truly profoundly happy okay and and so there's two good two good feelings but they they, they can they can they, they one can be used to help the other so i want to like that's i'm sorry to cut you off but you brought a lot of uh, interesting points that i want to dig a little bit more in so it's a very interesting perspective to say that, so what I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that 80% of people that are, um, that are showcasing dependency or addiction were genetically inclined from the, from the get-go um, to be more prone to develop an addiction or, or, or um, a dependency because of their, how they process dopamine and how they experience happiness. So that's Ex what I heard, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, and it's not just negative things. No, this is enough. important to understand. Fair so enough. let's say the, the seven-year-old discovers hockey. Yes. He loves hockey. He over-invests in hockey. He's going to become a really good hockey player. Yes. but that's And the then he's going to get... Yeah, fair enough. But that leads me to, because as, as, as somebody who works at, at you know, um, supporting parents in their journey, but as a parent myself, there's a lot of bells that are going on. Um, mm -hmm. you know, one, one parent would say, oh, my kid is just competitive, right? So, but what, what you're saying is that that kid may need to work at a level, a more intense level to be feeling the same kind of things that another kid would be experiencing playing a sport or whatever activity that produces joy they have to take it to another extreme to be able to feel the same level of happiness. So having said that, um, now as a parent, what should we be conscious of? Like what are the things that we need to be aware so that we can, you know, make, help or support kids to make healthy choices as opposed to choices that may not be as healthy for them when they're predisposed that way? And how do we find out that they are somewhat predisposed that way? Well, um, they're, in general, you can tell that they're predisposed that way from a couple of things without going to specialized labs, mm -hmm. okay? If there, is, if there is dependency in the family, okay? So genetically, grandpa, uncle Joe, whatever, the one parent or the other parent, if you have parents who have a tendency to excessively invest in pleasure, so it's really, it's really important to make the difference between joy and pleasure and happiness. So they're not the same thing, okay? So a parent who, in, who is over-invested might look at himself, a parent who, who enjoys alcohol too much, because basically what it translates to is they enjoy this much more than other people, okay? So when you have a, a young child and you have a child who is, is you know five six seven and they're really hard to please and they always have to have the six hundred dollar skates and the three hundred dollar hockey stick and they're never you know that you take them to dairy queen and a regular size soft ice cream dipped in chocolate for them it tastes like cardboard they need the banana split and the extra cherries and the extra sauce and everything is always naturally overly stimulating well instead of saying be reasonable 
Mm -hmm. it, it, that's like telling an epileptic who's having a seizure, well, stop shaking. It's not, it doesn't work like that. His natural state is going to be like that. So what you want to do to help that child is to help him direct that to at least two, at least two, and that's important, activities that are positive and productive that he can invest directly into. So allowing him just to overinvest in hockey is not a good idea. That's like jumping with one parachute. So it, it's going to work, but it's only one parachute. So if he gets injured when he's 16 and tears a knee and he can't, uh, he can't play hockey anymore and he's invested, you'll put all his eggs in the same basket and then the doctor gives him pain medication. Mm -hmm. And the kid can't, doesn't have access to his parachute of hockey. Well, the, he's, the kid has pain in his knee, but he is also emotionally suffering. He has pain and suffering. And unfortunately, he might like the doctor's pills a little bit too much. And he might use them to treat the component of suffering, not just the component of pain. And he can develop an addiction. Okay, now if, for example, he also invested in guitar, well, he busts his knee, he can't play hockey, so he becomes in hockey withdrawal, but he can compensate by playing his guitar an hour more a day. Then he's not going to have the same pain and suffering, and he has a lot less chance of liking the doctor's bills too much. You understand? So what we want to do is we want to orient to constructive positive activities that he is allowed to overindulge in because they're positive and they're constructive. So it's okay to buy that for me is real product. prevention. It's okay to buy the expensive skates for that specific sport um, when you yes, get it is. Yes. So what so a way for parents to support their kids through this and to develop those protective factors is to you know, support your kids in their passions and making sure that they're at least um, attracted to two strong hobbies or interests or passions that parents are supporting so that what you're saying is that's their healthy coping mechanism to be able to, um, first of all, like develop resilience, but develop that their, their potential to be happy through these two means. And if, if one falls through, then they can have a backup instead of using substance, for example, to, uh, to substitute. That, 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 that's absolutely right. And parents also need to know that sometimes your kids don't find the same activities ple as pleasurable as you did. So when I was a kid, I loved tennis. I was a tennis nut. I would play seven hours a day. None of my kids like tennis. So I mustn't push them into tennis. I have to accept that, oh, you know, they did judo and they did karate and they did music and they did hockey. And they did things that I didn't necessarily do or was necessarily good at, you know? So yeah, that's part of also the parent accepting that your child is different from you and may get off on certain things that are different from you and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So some of our, these are great preventive measures to be able to, you know, um, pay attention to what your kids are interested in and being able to support them through that. Some of the parents that are watching us today um, may be experiencing kids that are already experimenting with substances and are, are having concerns that it could develop into addiction or some of these kids, some of parents are maybe um, experiencing addiction with their kids. What would be your advice Re regarding exactly that about, you know, refocusing or how do we go about doing that with kids that are already using? Well, I would, I, I, I talk to high school students once in a while and what I find doesn't work is scaring them about the drugs, okay? Because they know that when they use it, they feel pleasure. So if I'm telling them like, this is wrong, they feel like I'm telling them not to have pleasure which I don't want to get across. In fact, I want them to have pleasure and I want them to have excessive pleasure. What the way I sell it to them is that the, the, the fact that the alcohol or the cannabis or whatever they're using 
is, is pleasurable is that it is taking away from them investing into other things that could give them the same pleasure, might take a little bit longer, might take a little bit more investment, but that builds their self-esteem at the same time. Um, so it's actually stopping them from developing and from becoming the extraordinary people they're supposed to become. Because I don't see this the, from the outset as a problem. I see this as a huge opportunity. And if you look, if we look around ourselves, we see a lot of singers and dancers and sports people and famous people who had dependency problems. Well, you know, if you've got a big emptiness as opposed to a little emptiness, well, it's easy to, you know, to, to compensate a little bit of dopamine. It's hard to compensate a big container of dopamine. But if you find something that's positive and constructive and active and that builds you up at the same time, that is how people become extraordinary. You can't be extraordinary while being ordinary at the same time. And the problem is, and this is the way I sell it to them, you guys who are like this, who like this stuff, you are extraordinary people waiting to develop. Now, either you're going to discover this in 20 years, which the average is somewhere between 15 and 20 years that somebody wakes up, or you can try it now and try to get involved in things and look for things that really resonate with who you are as a person and develop those things. But as long as you are eating McDonald's in, you know, uh, in terms of pleasure, uh, you're not gonna go after the really great steak because you filled up with stuff that's not so great. You know, so it, you, you have to learn to, to go after the things that really turn you on. You have to look for those things. You have to develop them. And that resonates more with them. So instead of telling them, I'm taking your drugs away, I'm telling them more that they're extraordinary, that they have huge potential because they have this huge dopamine emptiness. So they have this huge potential, but they're wasting it. They're wasting it on, you know, cigarettes because they're filling themselves up artificially. They feel pleasure, but they didn't do anything to deserve it. So by definition, that pleasure is only partial. The, the part missing is, I did it. You know, here I am, uh, 59 years old, and I still get pleasure thinking about some tennis shots that I did 20 years ago mm -hmm. or 30 years ago, you know? So, so it stays with you when you deserve it, when you invested and it came from you. And that gives long lasting dopamine. Okay. So that's how I sell it to those kids. And I sell it, I sell it to them the way I really think it is. They're extraordinary people waiting to happen. So, so a parent would approach their kid as well with that perspective, mm -hmm. the angle of saying, how does that make you feel in the long run? Like how mm -hmm. you're experiencing pleasure, but is that inducing to your self-esteem or, or is that building you up? Right. So are you finding something that, that is sustainable in, and uh, so is it, because I'm, I'm thinking of ways of parents approaching it when they're at a point of saying, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to talk to my kids. So that's, that's one of the good ways um, when we're talking about like building protective factors, right? So, so to help your kids. So one of the things is, mm -hmm. it, as you mentioned, um, finding those passions, nurturing those passions, um, taking interest in, in what your kids are interested in and supporting them through that. Um, is there any other protective factors that, that parents can help um, build with their kids so that their kids are, are more resilient or, or are, are less prone to develop an addiction? Well, giving them also coping mechanisms, because we've talked about pleasure, okay, so dopamine pleasure, but there, you know, for example, uh, cigarettes and alcohol also work on other systems that are responsible for decreasing anxiety. So sometimes a kid will drink because he wants to have a lot of fun and be in party mode. Other times, you know, he fails an exam or he breaks up with his girlfriend and he feels you know, anxious, and he'll drink 
and he'll get something else from the alcohol. He'll get, for example, angsty anxiety decrease. Okay, so he's looking for what we call anx anxiolysis. Okay, so he's going to look for I want to be less anxious. Well, if we teach, we've got to teach our kids how to deal with that kind of trauma in life. Life is, doesn't go perfectly all the time. We have to teach our children to grieve, okay? There's not a lot of grief training in our lives. You know, your dog dies, you're really, really, really sad. The, the, the solution is not drinking to forget that you're sad about your dog, mm -hmm. okay? Or to feel better artificially uh, because you can't deal with crying for the fact that your dog is, has passed. You're gonna have to learn to deal with grief. Um, and so that's for me is resiliency, okay? It's very interesting, I, take, I can take a hockey example. In our little town, uh, what, the first two, this struck me as brilliant, the first two hockey practices that the kids had when they were three and four years old were focused on teaching them how to get back up. It wasn't focused on teaching them how to skate because the thing is what people realize is the kids are trying so hard not to fall that they're not skating. Mm -hmm. So they come off the ice and daddy, daddy, I only fell once. Yeah, but you never touched the puck. You never went anywhere. You just walked around the ice. So the kids are kind of taken aback. The first thing is everybody down on the ground. And it's like, what's going on? Well, what's going on is we're going to teach you how to get up so you don't have to be so afraid of falling. Because in life, the kid who gets the puck is the kid who skates, 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 falls, gets up, skates, skates, falls, gets up. He falls six times on the way to the puck or on the way to an engineering degree. Mm -hmm. taught him to get up mm -hmm. okay okay and so that is another thing that we have to do in order to build resiliency in our kids is that they're able to bounce back and they're able to deal these things so the the, the another thing that we could talk we could talk about is um the having a, a a philosophy of life based on process instead of on results okay process if you take that word apart and you look at Latin, it means pro-being, okay? The promotion of being. So when we say it's the voyage, not the destination. So what, is, what are values of being? Values of being are being calm, being brave, being honest, being loyal, being faithful, being generous, being compassionate, being peaceful, being good, being humble, and being human. Those are values of being, okay? And values of being never depend on results, right? So mm -hmm. if you're generous and you, you lend your favorite bicycle to your next door neighbor's kid whose buses are on strike and who has to walk 10 kilometers to school and back every day, and she falls off the bike two weeks later and breaks both of her arms, the result is crappy but it doesn't remove the fact that you were generous, does it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that applies to all values of being. So if we, now we can't do this when they're seven years old. We can start, we can use words, oh, that was very brave of you, uh, that was very generous. We can underline not just, you know, you scored three goals, you're a great kid. Uh, maybe we should talk about, you made a really good, great effort today, you're a really good kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have to underline the process more than the, than the results. So because we can always process, we can always try. And the more you try, the more you become, even if it doesn't work out. So if you go to the gym and you try to lift a 10,000 pound dumbbell, you're, it's never going to move a millimeter. But your body, your body is going to move and you're going to become stronger for it even though the dumbbell mm -hmm. didn't move, okay? So we become stronger when we invest in our values, even if the outcome isn't great. Mm -hmm. So if things don't work out in life, well, at least you have what you, you know, an estimate of the value of the values that define yourself, mm -hmm. which is called self-esteem, 
okay? An estimate of the value of the values that constitute who you are. So that gives a certain form of resiliency because things don't always don't go well and we can't always deal with everything, but we, we can focus on, look, I did things the right way and it didn't work out. Things happen. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll cry the tears that I have to cry and then I'll move on. Mm -hmm. And that's either way, I would say in a nutshell, we make our kids stronger and we create a certain amount of prevention from falling into the traps of too many cigarettes or too much booze or too much anything else. Thank you, Dr. Sater. That's a great way of, of ending our talk today. Um, that, that's all the time we have, but it's been incredibly insightful. And I'm sure that parents are going to benefit from your perspective, your experience, and, and your expertise in the field. Um, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.